nor does this curse of curses cease with its author, but is justly entailed upon his children and his children's children unto the third and fourth generations. See yonder maimed and hobbling object of pity, his limbs distorted, his joints dislocated and racked with pain, his life tormented with running sores, his mind feeble, and passions ungovernable. All this is but the wages of his father's licentiousness. A physician once remarked to the author that a more prolific cause of scrofula, consumptions, and kindred affections did not probably exist than this sin of parents, adding that it often broke out two or three generations down and could rarely be eradicated from descendants. Oh, how great the crime! of thus cursing posterity, instead of blessing it with all the endowments conferred by virtuous love. Nor do many know how prevalent this disease is in its various forms. Its victims keep their own secret as long as possible and doctor themselves, except when their case becomes desperate, and then confide it only to their medical advisers, whose very profession forswears him to keep the secret. Oh, how many thousands of our young men have ruined their constitutions and become invalids for life solely by means of this disease or attempts to cure it. Indeed, its prevalence at the Sandwich Islands actually threatens the extinction of that nation, which at its present rate of mortality it is computed to affect in about sixty years. And if it goes on to increase in the ratio of its past progression, it will ultimately cut off our race itself. The fact that several thousand copies of a little work of less than twenty pages on the cure of venereal diseases are sold every month at one dollar per copy, and that other works of this class sell in proportion, shows conclusively that there are several thousand new victims every month. No patient wants more than a single work, yet 20,000 per month does not equal the sales of these works, and of course falls far short of the number of victims, for none but venereal patients will pay thus dear for so small a book, of no manner of interest to those not thus afflicted. All this besides all those who indulge with other than harlots by profession. Almost incredible, but nevertheless true. We thus see that nature as well as the Bible, condemns licentiousness, so that disbelievers in the latter are yet bound by nature's inflexible laws to continence, except in wedlock. But a point thus self-evident need not be urged. Beware, then, O passionate youth, how you commit this sin. Even though you neither fear God nor regard man, yet at least regard your own happiness, and induce not so terrible a curse. Matrimonial Excess But this is not the only form of sin assumed by this propensity. It invades married life and sows the seeds of misery within the hallowed pale of wedlock. Reference is not now had to those who, though married, seek foreign indulgence, but to those who know their own legal companion only. This will surprise many who are married, because they think themselves entitled to any desired amount of indulgence. Far otherwise, nature cares nothing, knows nothing about human enactments. Excessive indulgence between husband and wife produces all the consequences shown in the last chapter to result from excessive amativeness. A miserable victim of connubial excess is hardly less miserable than the victim of licentiousness. A newly married husband once called upon a medical friend of the author to prescribe for what he supposed to be venereal disease contracted from his wife. Soon after she called on the same errand, both accusing each other of having given the disease. He told both that their hymeneal excess had inflamed and diseased both and prescribed moderation. But what stamps effectually the seal of nature's reprobation on excessive matrimonial indulgence is its destruction of the health of woman. Is it not a most prolific cause of those distressing female complaints which bury half our married women prematurely 
and seriously impair most of the balance? Testify Dr. Sherwood, Banning, Hollick, Benjamin, and others in this line of practice. Are not these complaints alarmingly prevalent and occasioned mainly by excessive indulgence? Do not thousands of our women die annually in consequence? Speak out, ye weakly, nervous wives, now dying by wretched inches of these diseases, and say whether your sufferings were not caused mainly, and have not been aggravated to their very present painfulness by the frequency, the fury, the almost goatishness of your husband's demands. I say fury because though frequency is bad, yet harshness is worse. Nor do husbands always consider how exceedingly tender and how liable to consequent inflammation and disease this apparatus. Many a husband has buried more wives than one, killed outright, ignorantly, yet effectually, by the brutality of this passion. Reader, if thou knowest none such, thou knowest not the cause of all the deaths that transpire around thee. And yet the pulpit, the press, the lecture-room are silent in view of this vast, this wicked waste of life, of even the infinitely valuable life of woman. And tens of thousands of those whom it does not kill, it nevertheless despoils, by impairing both their sexual organs and their health, as well as minds. More, it cuts off the very pleasure sought. As overeating diminishes appetite, and thus curtails the gustatory pleasure sought, so excess here engenders those diseases which cut off this very pleasure, by causing the prolapsus uteri, albus, etc. It renders this intercourse utterly repugnant mentally, and painful physically, thus inducing the penalty in the direct line of the transgression. It deteriorates woman in the estimation of man. Besides, lust carries with itself the feeling of degradation. He who indulges frequently, even with his lawful wife, cannot but associate her in his mind with this debased feeling to which she administers. He first debases her by his brutality, and then despises her for being debased. It is a law of mind that this excess should produce contempt for its partner. Reader, did you ever hear the libertine speak well of woman as a sex? This fact is apparent, and you may always measure the sensuality of a man by his disrespect for the sex, and his moral purity by his estimation of woman. This is a perfect thermometer of moral purity. Its reasons are obvious. First, rogues suspect all mankind of being rogues, liars of being deceptive, and the sensual of sensuality. Secondly, he has been mainly conversant with woman as a sexual thing, and not as a pure, refined, and affectionate being. Her sexuality mainly is what he has noticed, and this he detests in himself, and therefore in her. Woman thus abused also soon comes to feel herself humbled, broken down, and sunk in the scale of self-respect by being put to so low a use. And let the sensual husband remember that knowing ones can read his treatment of her in this respect by these and kindred signs, that is, in her downcast, self-degraded looks and mien. But over this saddening picture of woe, let us draw the curtain of silence while we shed tears of pity over her sufferings. Woman fallen, her loveliness engulfed in the fiery sea of lust, her angelic purity and perfection converted into corruption, the angel becoming the animal, a mere sexual thing, and all by violating a plain law of nature, meet punishment for so sensual a sin. Much has of late been said as regards the elevation of woman on the one hand, and her natural inferiority on the other, without disturbing this mooted question, further than to say that she is equally perfect with man in her sphere, which is equally elevated with his, that she is as perfect as the God of nature could render her, allow special attention to be called to the one specific cause of her disrepute. 
It is man's sensuality. How does the Turk regard woman? As a mere thing, destitute of a soul, and of all intrinsic merit. Now look at the one animal end to which he puts her, and put the two together. Wherefore the harem, simply to feed his sensuality, and this very sensuality breeds this contempt for its object. The same holds true of all mankind, and governs individuals as well as masses. The libertine always despises his bird after he has sated his passion, and because of such indulgence. Sensual indulgence begets disgust for its object. This is a law of mind, and is as true in wedlock as out of it. Hence, other things being equal, in proportion as a man indulges sensually with woman as a sex, does he despise the sex, or as an individual does he underrate her individually? Nor say what you will, can woman ever be raised to her true dignity, or be properly appreciated, till licentiousness is superseded by pure love? Moral purity will elevate woman in exact proportion to its prevalence, while licentiousness, in and of itself, and by virtue of its own inherent nature, sinks her in the scale of valuation in exact proportion as it rises. This is cardinal truth, and shows those who would labor for the elevation of woman where to begin, and what obstacle alone prevents. We might mention many more evils that grow out of the matrimonial prostitution, but are not these amply sufficient to stamp it as most infamous in its nature, because most direful in its consequences? Indeed, I regard its magnitude as scarcely less than that of promiscuous indulgence, because its evils are substantially the same, and scarcely less aggravated, and partly because so much prevalent. It offers much greater facilities and temptations. It costs nothing in and of itself, though many a husband has paid out more in the form of doctors' and nurses' bills, etc., than his licentious neighbor has for promiscuous indulgence. It is almost universal in married life, and is burying its victims ten to one faster than its twin sister, promiscuous intercourse. Mere sensual indulgence as such in wedlock, or out of it, in and of itself, sensualizes the mind, debases the feelings, and engenders depravity in all its other forms. It is fire to the nervous system, which, diseased, irritates all the propensities and depraves the entire being. Mark, ye husband, whose demands are frequent, the increased irritability and fretfulness and crossness of your wives the next day, and learn from these principles both the cause and cure. We must not omit to mention the double injury occasioned by indulging while she is fulfilling her maternal relations. At these periods she almost always loathes it, proof enough that it is then wrong. Besides, it withdraws that vital energy required by her precious charge. It also sensualizes the charge, it partaking by sympathy with its mother's feelings. Nor have I a doubt but that the seeds of much of the sensuality of mankind are sown by parental indulgence before birth. Then at least should the mother's mind be kept as pure and elevated as possible, and her physical stamina promoted, not drained off to feed a sensual passion. Husbands, be entreated to mark well this entire chapter. In this particular you are mainly in fault. Your wives could not impose upon you in this matter if they would, and rarely would if they could. But do you not often insist on compliance, and almost compel it, when very disagreeable to them? Oh, be not thus cruel. Wait at least for reciprocity, and then guard carefully against all pain and injury. Would that these truths might reach every married pair in Christendom. Private Sensuality But we have not reached all the evils of the worst form of excessive and perverted amativeness. However prevalent both licentiousness proper and legalized licentiousness, private fornication 
our regard is at least equal to either, and much more prevalent than the first named. Our youth by wretched thousands, I, millions. Too conscientious to violate the literal law of chastity, seek in solitude that same gratification which constitutes sensuality itself. The two differ in nothing except in the substitution of an imaginary partner for a real one, in the complete absence of that love which alone can sanctify this indulgence, and in its being all sensuality, as well as, if possible, a still more unnatural and effectual violation of nature's laws. Do not both consist equally in warp and woof of sensuality? Is not the same propensity indulged in both? Are not the same feelings exercised, and in the same way, saving that its partner, so indispensable to both, is imaginary here, but real there? Is not the kind of gratification sought and afforded alike in both? Are not both precisely alike in debasing the character? The same feelings, the same organs, the same action in these organs, the same evacuations, except that private prostitution is necessarily more completely gross and lustful, as well as more injurious to the organs exercised. Besides the far greater number of its subjects, and the far greater frequency of its indulgence. Is licentious debasing and polluting to the soul? And is not self-pollution even more so? Does it not create even a greater degree of shame, and self-abhorrence, and vulgarity? Does the former disease the sexual apparatus, and does not the latter equally, probably more? Does the former often produce impotency, and does not the latter much more frequently? Does the former derange the nervous system, and does not the latter equally, and fill the entire system full to bursting, with a wild, hurried, fevered excitement, which rouses every animal passion, unstrings every nerve, and produces complete frustration and confusion? Does the former drain the system of animal energy, and waste the very essence of its vitality, and does not the latter equally rob every organ of the body, every faculty of the mind, of that vital energy by which alone it lives and acts? In short, it is hardly possible to name an evil which appertains to the former, which does not also characterize the latter, whilst the latter, by being so much more accessible, subjecting its possessor to no expense but that of life, and no shame, because perpetrated in secret, is therefore the more widespread, frequent, and ruinous. Nor is it considered a sin. Shame on those pretended moral watchmen who do not denounce it, and therefore not opposed by the terrors of conscience. Nor does that almost insuperable barrier of native modesty created in the soul of every well-constituted youth against licentiousness avail much here because its natural stimulant, the presence of the other sex, is not present to bring it into action. It is also practiced at a much earlier age, and while the system is yet immature, and all the strength required for growth, thus sapping the constitution in its infancy, and hence the more completely irreparable and fatal. If asked my serious opinion as to the comparative evils of these two forms of excessive or perverted amativeness, considered collectively as working the greatest ruin in our age and nation, and causing the greatest amount of suffering and woe, I should answer unhesitatingly, as the result of my extensive observation and mature conviction, private fornication, ten to one. And this is substantially the opinion of all who have examined this subject. If asked which I should prefer a child of mine to practice, O oh, merciful God, deliver me from so dreadful a dilemma, my unequivocal answer would be, rather let the dear child die, be it even by revolting suicide, any other cup of bitterness sooner. Nothing, O oh, fond parent, can render your beloved offspring more completely wretched. Signs of Sensuality 
in its various forms. Satan never keeps secrets. Murder will out, and so will sensuality. We can tell the rake and designate the wanton, and say truly, who has known the other sex and how, as well as who seeks solitary gratification, and who is pure. The signs of all these things come to the surface and cannot be disguised. To transfer all these signs to paper is impossible, nor can a fraction of them be fully given without too much digression. Many of them the natural language of the faculties discloses, which a phrenologist alone can fully understand. If by casting her eyes over a congregation the lewd woman can easily select her patrons, why cannot we also discern them? We can by the following, among other indices, carrying the hands frequently to these organs by way of changing their position, or sitting with the former partly enclosing the latter, because the latter being inflamed by overaction are uneasy, and the former are carried to and move them about to give relief. Such, if married, may know only their own companion but it will be both lustful and excessive. If unmarried, they either abuse themselves or else seek foreign indulgence, which may be distinguished by a slight difference in a certain position, often assumed by each, which the natural language of amativeness perfectly explains. The amorous man has also a lascivious expression of the eyes and lips, and always manifests sexual curiosity when he observes females, and often turns to look at them, or when anything is said about the other sex, he acts or laughs as if something very curious or wanton or vulgar had been said, and relishes it, because he looks at everything through glasses of lust, or else he unequivocally condemns and denounces everything pertaining to this subject, especially by way of obviating this evil as foul and filthy because to him it is so. A rake can easily be marked by these and kindred signs. Reader, is it expedient to give the indices of wantonness in woman? Yet they are equally, if not still more apparent. The solitary libertine may be known, partly by these signs, and in addition by the following. In conversation, he never looks you full in the face, but averts his eyes especially downward, as if ashamed of himself. He also avoids meeting the glances of females, yet steals every opportunity to look at them, and intently observes particularly those portions which constitute and characterize the sex. The very shy of females, and all in a tremor while in their presence, when others are by, yet when alone he is forward, and gross in his advances, and apt to take liberties, and is silly and sickish in their company, as if prompted by a mean passion, instead of being actuated by that love which maketh not ashamed. Mark well this fundamental difference between the conduct of those who are actuated by true love and by lust in any of its forms. Now precisely this difference obtains touching the manners, carriage, Expression, everything of his conduct toward woman, whose emotiveness is pure or perverted. The private sensualist may be further known by his pallid, bloodless countenance, and hollow, sunken, and half-ghastly eyes, the lids of which will frequently be tinged with red. While if his indulgence has been carried very far, he will have black and blue semicircles under his eyes, and also look as if worn out almost dead for want of sleep, yet unable to get it, etc. He will also have a half-wild, half-vacant stare, or half-lascivious, half-foolish smile, especially when he sees a female. He will also have a certain quickness, yet indecision of manner, will begin to do this thing, then stop and essay to do that, and then do what he first intended, and in such utterly insignificant matters as putting his hat here or there, etc. The same incoherence will characterize his expressions, and the same want of promptness mark all he does, 
little things will agitate and fluster him, nor will he be prompt or resolute or bold or forcible, but timid, afraid of his own shadow, uncertain, waiting to see what is best, and always in a hurry, yet hardly knowing what he is doing or wants to do, nor will he walk erect or dignified, as if conscious of his manhood and lofty in his aspirations, but will walk and move with a diminutive, cringing, sycophantic, inferior, mean, self-debased manner, as if depreciated and degraded in his own eyes, thus telling you perpetually by his ashamed looks and sheepish manner that he has been doing something low, mean, contemptible, and vulgar. His secret practices have impaired both his physical and mental manhood, and thereby effaced the nobleness and efficiency of the masculine, and deteriorated his soul, besides having ruined his body. Be entreated, O foolish and wicked, not thus to dethrone the man and enthrone the animal. He will, moreover, be dull of comprehension, incorrect, forgetful, heedless, full of blunders of all sorts, crude and inappropriate in his jokes, slow to take the hint, listless, inattentive, absent-minded, sad, melancholy, easily frightened, easily discouraged, wanting in clearness and point of idea, less bright than formerly, and altogether depreciated in looks and talents compared with what he would have been if he had never contracted this soul and body-ruining practice. Pain at or near the small of the back is another dark symptom. It at least shows that the sexual apparatus is diseased, because the nerve from them enters the spinal column at this place, so that their inflammation renders it proportionally tender and painful. Sexual excess in any of its forms will give this pain. True, other causes may have deranged these organs and given this pain, yet this is the great cause. Some victims of this passion have running sores in the small of the back and are generally tender there. Many other signs evince carnality, yet these must suffice. Nor am I quite clear in giving these, because they will expose so many of my erring fellow men, now unsuspected. Yet again, such are dangerous and ought to be exposed, at least allowed to tell their own carnal story. Let every sensualist, especially private libertine, remember that he is marked and known, and read by all men who have eyes and know how to use them. This exposition is made in part to shame them out of degrading vice into moral purity and virtue. Remedies Thus much of these evils, next their remedies. All the penalties of nature's violated laws are not wholly incurable. A healing balm is kindly furnished for such wounds as are not mortal. Though it may be impossible, after these evils have become aggravated, for their subject to be as healthy and happy as he would have been if he had never sinned. Yet our merciful physician has furnished at hand both palliatives and restoratives by the judicious and thorough use of which he may become as sound in body and as strong in mind as he ever has been, perhaps better, because he is yet immature. When the consequences of this vice have not gone so far as to impair or destroy the structure, a comparative cure is attainable, and even though the organization itself is seriously affected, yet as nature restores a broken bone or flesh wound, so here she will often repair breaches apparently irreparable. Though as a broken bone or a sprained joint is more liable to subsequent injury than if it had never been impaired, yet as long and as far as life and constitution remain, they hold out the blessed promise of recovery and happiness. Unfortunate reader, however foolish and sinful you may have been, never despair, first because discouragement greatly impedes cure, and secondly, 
because the constitutional tendency of your disease is to render you more gloomy and disheartened than you need be. Be it that your case is bad, you regard it as much worse than it really is. If it were fatal, you would be now literally dying. The flag of truce is yet flying. Because you have entered the broad road, you are not compelled to go down to final ruin. The door of escape is yet open. Few cases are desperate. Most men can be well-nigh cured. Listen, then, to the means of salvation. You must cure yourselves. Nor is the task easy, but it requires effort, perseverance, and temporary self-denial. You must do, instead of passively folding your hands, to which you are inclined. Be it that a cure requires hard work, are not life, health, happiness worth working hard to obtain? If in the Niagara Rapids, and certain to be precipitated over its yawning precipice, in case you remain passive, but could save yourself by powerful effort, would you fold your hands? Would you not tax every energy of life to its utmost? What will not man do for his life? And your life is at stake, and the prize of effort. I hear your eager inquiry, What shall I do to be saved? Abstain totally. The least indulgence weakens hope and is like paddling the canoe down the Niagara Rapids instead of toward its banks. Gradual emancipation, like leaving off drinking by degrees, will certainly increase both indulgence and suffering. This is true of all bad habits, is a law of things, and especially applicable here. Now is the accepted time Behold, now is the day of salvation. Some of my contemporaries advise occasional indulgence. From this I dissent and totally and unequivocally condemn all indulgence, every instance of which both augments passion and weakens resistance by subjecting intellect and moral sentiment to propensity. If you cannot conquer now, you never can. Make one desperate stand and struggle. Summon every energy. Not once more. Stop short. Touch not. Taste not. Handle not. Lest you perish with the using. Flee at once to perfect continence, your only city of refuge. Look not back toward Sodom, lest you die. Why will you go on to commit suicide? O son or daughter of sensuality, Are you of no value? Are you not godlike and God-endowed, born in your Maker's image, and most exalted both by nature and in your capabilities for enjoyment? Oh, will you, for a low-lived animal gratification, sell the birthright of your nature, all your intellectual powers, all your moral endowments, all your capabilities of enjoyment, and crowd every avenue and corner of both body and soul, with untold agony? Behold the priceless gem of your nature. O oh, snatch it from impending destruction. Total abstinence is life. Animal, intellectual, moral. Indulgence is triple death. Resolution, determination to stop now and forever, is your starting point, without which no other remedial agents will avail anything. Abstinence or death is your only alternative. Stop now and forever, or abandon all hope. Will you long debate which of the two to choose, slavery and death, and such a death, or abstinence and life? Do you return to your wallowing and give up to die? No. Behold and shout the kindling resolve. See the intoxicating poison cup of passion dashed aside. Hear the lifeboat resolution I wash away the stain of the past in the reformation of the future. Born with capabilities thus exalted, I will yet be the man, no longer the groveling sensualist. Forgetting the past, I once more put on the garments of hope and press forward in pursuit of those noble ends to which I once aspired, but from which this Delilah allured me. I will rise yet, On the bended knees of contrition and supplication, 
I bow before Jehovah's mercy seat. On the altar of this hour, I lay my vow of abstinence and purity. No more will I sacrilegiously prostitute those glorious gifts with which thou hast graciously crowned me. I abjure forever this loathsome sin and take the oath of allegiance to duty and to thee. O deliver me from temptation. Of myself I am weak, but in thy strength I am strong. Do thou work in me to will and to do only what is pure and holy. I have served the lusts of the flesh, but oh, forgive and restore a repentant prodigal and accept that entire consecration of my every power and faculty to thee. O gracious God, forgive and save and accept for Jesus' sake, and thine shall be the glory for ever. Amen. I rise a renewed man. My vow is recorded before God. I will keep it inviolate. I will banish all unclean thoughts and feelings and indulge only in holy wedlock. I will again press forward in the road of intellectual attainment and moral progression, and the more eagerly because of this hindrance. I drop but this one tear over the past, and then bury both my sin and shame in future efforts of self-improvement and labors of love. As mourning over my fall does not restore, but unnerves resolution and cripples effort, I cast the mantle of forgetfulness over the past, I have now to do only with the future, nor must I remain a moment passive and idle. I have a great work before me, first to repair my shattered constitution, which is the work, not of a day, but of my life, and also to recover my mental stamina and moral standing, and if possible, to soar higher still. What shall I do first? Regain your health. Your sufferings and losses grow mainly out of the injury it has sustained, and to regain it is indispensable to both effort and enjoyment, and your great salvation from the consequences of past sins, and prevention of future ones. In effecting this restoration, you have mainly to obviate that inflammation already shown to have chiefly engendered your sufferings and produced disease. Reduce it, and you both forestall farther injury, and give to nature, your great physician, an opportunity to repair the breach. Dr. Troll in the Hydropathic Encyclopedia remarks, In constitutions worn down by previous diseases, exhausted by riotous living, and undermined by abused amativeness, the cure requires a strict and persevering observance of all the laws of hygiene that the patient may outgrow rather than doctor out his ruinous ways. Unfortunately, however, there is no class of patients more fickle, vacillating, and unreliable. The mind partakes of the bodily degeneracy, and it requires a combination of rare and favorable circumstances to keep them from running after every foolish and whimsical impostor who advertises to cure them with a single bottle of bitters which, moreover, is pleasant to the taste. Avoid all stimulants and narcotics. Inflammation being the chief cause of your difficulty, everything calculated to increase it is unequivocally bad. Hence, abandon wholly and at once tea, coffee, tobacco, and all stimulating meats and drinks. Otherwise, your struggle will be much more doubtful, tedious, and desperate. Any other fire burning in the system will augment this. Tea, coffee, and tobacco, the last two in particular, are powerful narcotics. And like opium, though soothing at first, ultimately only re-inflame, and are of themselves sufficient to keep up both the disease and the desire, and the inflammation you would conquer. They even often induce them by causing an irritated craving state of the nervous system which aggravates desire from the first, by inflaming the nervous system, and of course the base of the brain. It is a settled physiological fact that whatever stimulates the body thereby proportionally irritates the base of the brain. Amativeness in particular 
and thus causes lust as well as sinful propensity in general. By this means is it that all intoxicating drinks cause both lust and depravity. It is their stimulating property which does this, and whatever stimulates the body thereby stimulates the whole base of the brain. In consequence of that most intimate relation existing between the two, and therefore excites this passion, and more probably than any other. Now tea, coffee, and tobacco all stimulate, and of course excite both sinful propensity in general, and lustful desire in particular. The quid and the cigar have made sensualists and onans by the legion. Nor is coffee free from a like charge, and tea is also injurious. This is not all theory, it is sustained by facts. An acquaintance of the author, whose passion, professor though he is, is yet so rampant that he can govern himself only with the utmost difficulty, says that after he has restrained himself for months and got desire under subjection, a few cups of strong coffee will set him literally crazy after the sex, so that slight temptation will induce indulgence. And then, the helm carried away, self-control is out of the question, till this passion has run him through and out, and brought him up debilitated and all on fire by excess and penniless, after having squandered the savings of months of industry, perhaps years. He also recommends cathartics, yet their effect can be only temporary. Ultimately, they must debilitate the system. He says nothing saves him but total abstinence, both from indulgence and from all stimulants. Besides, why make flesh of one passion and fowl of another? Why not sweep the board, break away from all bad habits, conquer every lust, and be the man? For in nothing consists the true dignity and glory of our nature more than in self-government. Even if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, much more may you abandon that filthy and confessedly injurious habit of tobacco-eating and burning, else it may yet shipwreck your hopes. Come, arise in the might of manhood, and conquer this as a means of overcoming that. And ye daughters of loveliness, whom this feeling has injured, but who would return again to purity, health, and happiness, sip no more of the beverage of China, no more of the drinks of Java, for both will only add fuel to those polluting fires you wish to quench, as well as perpetuate the disease you would subdue. Try the experiment. If you doubt this logic, compare a month of abstinence with one of tea and coffee drinking. Already your system is all alive with feverish excitement, which these drinks enhance, and this deepens your gloom and misery. If you would be yourself again, cut off this right-hand gratification as a means of overcoming that. And if you ask what you shall drink at your meals, I say nothing is best. Yet cocoa, chocolate, or warm water seasoned, or bread coffee, rice coffee, pea coffee, corn coffee, etc., etc., will be good substitutes, as they do not inflame and are palatable. For a similar reason, meats, mustards, condiments, peppers, spices, rich food, gravies, everything heating and irritating, will only add to existing inflammation and increase both desire and disease. Do not keepers of horses who wish to fire up this passion in them do it by feeding high? Farmers do the like by the female in order to create the required desire. Do not men and women, by the licentious thousand, live luxuriously for the express purpose of kindling this disease? Go and do the opposite, ye who would produce the opposite results. Some kinds of food, as already specified, excite amorous desires, while others, as rice, bread, fruit, vegetables, etc., do not, and may therefore be eaten, yet sparingly, because you are yet weak, and because overeating, even of the plainest food, is injurious. We have also seen that sensuality is apt to excite appetite and deranged digestion. 
coarse or graham bread with fruit or rice or sago or tapioca or potato starch pudding, etc., will tend to obviate inflammation and allow the system to rally. In regard to the regimen, Dr. Woodward remarks thus, The regimen must be strict. The diet should be simple and nutritious and sufficient in quantity. It should be rather plain than light and abstemious. No stimulating condiments should be used. The supper should be particularly light, and late supper should be wholly avoided. All stimulating drinks, even strong tea and coffee, should be discarded. Cider and wine are very pernicious. Tobacco in all its forms, not less so. As to suppers, I recommend none at all. A full stomach induces dreams, or the exercise in sleep, of those organs most liable to spontaneous action, which in this case is amativeness, which produces libidinous dreams, with accompanying night emissions, which weaken and disease equally with indulgence. No supper at all also allows the dinner to become fully digested, which facilitates sound sleep, nature's great restorative. Never fear starvation. We all eat twice too much. The gluttony of our nation is one great cause of its sensuality, which fasting will, of course, tend to obviate. Try the experiment. A friend thus afflicted has found great relief therefrom. Above all things, keep doing. An idle brain is Satan's workshop, in this respect preeminently. Keep your mind employed, and lewd feelings can find no entrance. But unoccupied they become unbidden, and renew former associations and habits. But be very careful not to overdo, especially overlift. As you recover, you are in great danger of considering yourself stronger than you really are, and thus strain your back, and bring on a relapse of your night difficulty. Mark this caution. Graham's recommendation to touch these organs as little as possible, and to bring up children thus, I cordially endorse, because contact necessarily promotes both desire and inflammation. Prevention. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, here preeminently. Not to begin is the only safety, nor is this prevention difficult. Nature has taken effectual means to secure this end. That wall of native modesty, which she has thrown around every well-constituted youth, is ample protection. They only require to be put upon their guard. They would not fall into these habits unless coaxed into them, nor then if they once suspected them of being either wrong or injurious. Such knowledge would furnish an all-powerful stimulant to modesty and render it effectual. They now suspect no harm, and intend no more wrong than in eating. To know that it is virtually on a par with sexual intercourse in its corrupting influence on the mind and in its injury of the health would awaken conscientiousness to join effort with modesty and save nearly all. But ignorance lulls conscience, and persuasion and imitation overcome shame, and they enter the broad road and soon find that death is in the practice. The simple knowledge of the fact that these practices sap their capabilities of enjoying this same pleasure in wedlock would also prevent personal indulgence, as in love and parentage it was shown to be a preventive of licentiousness. Diffusing appropriate knowledge and circulating appropriate books on this subject will work an effectual cure and I anticipate great good from the means and efforts now in progress touching this matter. The premature development of amativeness is, however, the great hothouse of sensuality in all its forms. Nature has taken special pains to postpone the development of this instinct until intellect has attained sufficient strength to guide it, the moral sentiments power enough to sanctify and restrain it, and the body sufficient maturity to sustain its drain with impunity. Is not this postponement a most beautiful provision? If it had made its appearance as early as the others, 
it would have withdrawn those energies from the system required for growth, yet have done no good. As it is, however, nature postpones the matrimonial desires till the subject is prepared to regulate this instinct and convert it into a means of incalculable enjoyment. At precisely what age it should develop itself may be difficult to say, but certainly not till from the eighteenth to the twentieth year. And then it is held in effectual check by native modesty for a considerable time before it acquires sufficient impetus to make love outright, and finally takes years to ripen into a state prepared for marriage, at least for its ultimate rights. Would to God and humanity that nature were allowed to have her perfect work in this respect, but alas, our youth are reared in a hotbed of amativeness. This impulse is developed several years before its time, and hence mainly its perversion. Ye who labor and pray for the banishment of lust and the moral purity of man, mark well the cause of causes of man's carnality in all its forms. It is the artificial stimulation and the premature development of the sexual instinct. Mark the following incentives of premature love and its morbid sensual direction from Fowler on matrimony. The conduct and conversation of adults before children and youth. How often have I blushed with shame and kindled with indignation at the conversation of parents, and especially of mothers, to their children. John, go and kiss Harriet, for she is your sweetheart. Well may shame make him hesitate and hang his head. Why, John, I did not think you so great a coward. Afraid of the girls, are you? That will never do. Come, go along and hug and kiss her. There, that's the man. I guess you will love the girls yet. Continually he is teased about the girls and being in love till he really selects a sweetheart. I will not lift the veil nor expose the conduct of children among themselves. And all this because adults have filled their heads with those impurities which surfeit their own. What could more effectually wear off that natural delicacy, that maiden purity and bashfulness, which form the main barrier against the influx of vitiated amativeness. How often do those whose modesty has been worn smooth even take pleasure in thus saying and doing things to raise the blush on the cheek of youth and innocence merely to witness the effect of these improper illusions upon them, little realizing that they are thereby breaking down the barriers of their virtue and prematurely kindling the fires of animal passion. As puberty approaches, the evil magnifies. The prematurely kindled embers of love now burst forth into the unextinguishable flames of unbridled licentiousness or self-pollution. Most of the conversation of young people is upon love matters or used in throwing or pretending to parry the shafts of love. And nearly all their plays abound in kissing, mock marriages, etc., etc., the entire machinery of balls and parties, of dances, and the other amusements of young people tend to excite and inflame this passion. Thinking it a fine thing to get in love, they court and form attachments long before either their mental or physical powers are matured. Of course these young loves, these greenhouse exotics, must be broken off, and their miserable subjects left burning up with the fierce fires of a flaming passion, which if let alone would have slumbered on for years till they were prepared for its proper management and exercise. Nor is it merely the conversation of adults that does all this mischief. Their manners also increase it. Young men take the hands of girls from six to thirteen years old, kiss them, press them, and play with them, so as in a variety of ways to excite this organ combined a grant with friendship and refinement, for all this is genteelly done. They intend no harm, and parents dream of none, and yet their embryo love is awakened, to be again still more easily excited. Maidens and even married women often express similar feelings towards lads, not perhaps positively improper in themselves, yet injurious in their ultimate effects. 
reading novels, love tales, etc. injurious. The fashionable reading of the day is still more objectionable. As to its amount, let publishers and the editors of family newspapers testify. Whose sales are the greatest? Whose patronage is the most extensive? Those who publish the most novels and the best love tales. Let those weeklies that boast of their 30,000 subscribers and claim the largest circulation in the world have a red line drawn across every column containing a story, the substance and seasoning of which is love and more than half their entire contents will be crimsoned with this sign of amativeness. Try this experiment, and it will astonish you. Country newspapers also must have a part, or the whole of some love tale every week, or else run down. These stories girls are allowed and encouraged to read. How often have I seen girls, not twelve years old, as hungry for a story or novel, as they should be for their dinners. A sickly sentimentalism is thus formed, and their minds are sullied with impure desires. Every fashionable young lady must, of course, read every new novel, though nearly all of them contain exceptionable illusions, perhaps delicately covered over with a thin gauze of fashionable refinement, yet on that account the more objectionable. If this work contained one improper illusion to their ten, Many of those fastidious ladies, who now eagerly devour the vulgarities of Marriott and the double entendres of Bulwer, and even converse with gentlemen about their contents, would discountenance or condemn it as improper. Shame on novel-reading women, for they cannot have pure minds or unsullied feelings, but Cupid and the bow, and waking dreams of love, are fast consuming their health and virtue." Not that I impute the least blame to those respectable editors and publishers who fill their coffers by feasting this diseased public appetite, especially of the ladies, and even though they pander to and increase this worse vice of this our vicious age and nation, any more than I blame grog-sellers for making money out of another diseased public taste, because both are aiming mainly at dollars and cents, yet stabbing public virtue to the heart but their money will be a curse to them, and their trash is a curse to its readers. A heating, stimulating diet still more prematurely develops this passion. By heating up and fevering the body, it of course fevers the propensities, but none more than this. We have already seen that meats, teas, coffee, mustards, spices, etc. stimulate it in adults. Hence, they, of course, induce precocious sexuality in children. On this account, if on no other, these things, coffee in particular, are utterly unfit for the young. Rather feed them on what will allay this impulse, instead of prematurely exciting it. Nor can we expect the world to become pure morally till a correct system of dietetics is generally practiced. A heating diet, after all, is the most prolific cause of excessive and perverted sexuality. Parents, mind what you feed your children. Youth, observe a correct regimen. Married and single, who would reduce this feeling? Eat and drink cooling and calming articles only.